All right, all right. Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody. Um, hope everyone is doing well. I pray that you and your families are healthy and everybody is enjoying this wonderful Rochester weather that we are having uh, today. It is my understanding before we get started that um, I did see a really nice um, informational piece on social media that said refuge would be delayed a day um, due to the holiday on uh, Labor Day on Monday. So I just wanted to remind our citizens and, and everyone that uh, your refuge will be delayed a day. Um, and you know, uh, today is my anniversary, so it's 27 years. So I'm gonna do my best to pick the queen up on time today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call the Parks and Public Works Committee to order, and I ask the clerk to please call the roll. Sure. Councilmember Lightfoot? Present. Councilmember Gruber? Here. Councilmember Pio? Here. President Melendez? Here. Thank you. Thank you. We have no presentations um, tonight, but we will be uh, in, in October. Uh, inter so I'm going to go straight into um, the uh, information that we have on, on, on our agenda today. Introduction number 344, a bond ordinance of the city of Rochester, New York, authorizing the issuance of 156,000 bonds of said city to finance the Honorable Loretta C. Scott Center for Human Service Building Automation Systems Project. Any questions, comments, and or concerns? Move it. It's been moved. Second. And second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Introductory passes. Motion carries. Introduction number 345, uh, authorizing agreement for the Honorable Loretta C. Scott Center for Human Service Building Automation System Project. Any questions, comments, and or concerns? Move it. It's second. been moved and second. Now we vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Introductory number 346, authorizing an agreement for the Rundell Library Elevator Modernization Project. There is one disclosure from Council Member Gruber, as he is a city council liaison to the library board. He is only required to disclose this information and may participate in the discussion and the vote. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Just one. Uh, council President. Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, I've, I've been catching wind and experienced some, some issues with uh, elevators. It seems to be a problem across our infrastructure of the city. And um, just, just wanted to get a sense of um, how challenging it is to, to keep on top of some of the elevators now. I mean, I know that at the Jackson R Center, for example, uh, the elevator is down now, and then it takes a while for these things to get uh, repaired or replaced. Um, and if there's an overall plan looking across the city infrastructure to um, kind of target elevators over time, or what, what's, what's the, the game here? Sure, Council President, I'll answer that uh, in two parts. First off, in terms of our planning and inventorying and evaluation of the systems themselves, that's done as is for all of our facilities. So as elevators are identified, they'll be programmed appropriately. What you're really getting at is a function of as these things age, they require maintenance. There's only a few companies that do elevator maintenance and repair. So um, as these things go, they age, and everybody eventually has aging elevators. Um, it's probably been a while. Some of the people I think up here were probably around when, for example, the Sister Cities garage elevators were done probably 12 to, 12 to 15 years ago now. Um, they took, well, I'll say 10 to 12 years ago. It was pretty significant only because regardless of the vendor, um, it still took a while for them to get out there. And when they were put in any types of issues, there's only a limited number of people that can get out there and fix it. So we're very much on top of identifying them, but like anything else, um, it's, not, it's not quite the same as uh, if you head over to 945 Mount Reed Boulevard, uh, Building 100 for equipment services. We got plenty of people in there that can service any type, make, model of vehicle. Elevators, no, it's all done through contractors and there's a limited number of them. So that can, that can add to delays in the time it takes to get those repaired. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? If not, I entertain a motion. Move it. Second. It's been moved and second. Now we vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. <clears throat> Excuse me. Introductory number 347, authorizing a change in traffic flow, uh, alterations of pavement widths, and acquisition of easement for Genesee Street reconstruction project, Elmwood Avenue to Brooks Avenue. A public hearing will be held on Thursday, September 14th. 2023 at 6 p.m. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Councilmember um, Patterson. 
and then uh, Dr. Gruber. Okay, so I'm of two minds of this. I'm always in favor of work and, and, and road work, but this section of road is already extremely tight. And I, I'm, it just if you can just share with us the sensibility for making that road tighter. I get it, it's to slow people down, but um, it, it's scary now as you drive through it. And this is the time of year I spend a lot of time driving through there. Um, so if you could just share a little bit more in the thinking over there and uh, what the plans are and, and the bump outs, I, I get that stuff, but it's, you know, you got a lot of students living over there. You got a lot of, you got a lot of people stopping and going for lack of a better way of putting it in making that road tighter. I, I, in a normal sense, it would be, yeah, it'll make it, it'll slow it down. I'm, I'm worried about what the accident impact might be as you tighten that road. So council member, I mean, I would, I would respond that we have a complete streets policy. We now have an active transportation plan that we're beginning to work on. We're also incorporating a good amount of public input um, by a very engagement, by a various engagement methods. And generally what we're finding is, is that as we did this, um, the responses were no, we're, we're in favor of this, that's okay. slowing it down. Um, you're absolutely right, but there's a balance there that we're trying to achieve. And some of these roads are, are, you know, like the old adage goes, you know, built build roads like rifles, people drive like bullets. So we want to make sure that we're doing what we can. And there have been some issues, but round, I would say it's been roundly accepted even by the advocacy community um, that these are good things. Now, with that said, of course, we're always looking at, at, at bringing balance again, mm -hmm. um, motorists trying to make sure that they're, they're also accommodated. Um, given the, the volumes that we see on Genesee Street um, and the input and feedback we've received, we feel that this is a good design that's going to meet all of those needs. And ideally, as you notice, start to slow those things down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously there's a balance that you have to have there, but ultimately um, we can only engineer it to a point. After that, we, we really do need good decisions being made by operators. Um, and so if we can do them, and if we can give them the physical cues to do that, which this project does as designed, I think you're gonna see, a, a, I think you're gonna see an, an impact in safety once it's completed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Gruber, Councilman Gruber. Thank you, Chair Lake. But and yeah, Commissioner Perrin, I, this I might just be asking you to repeat yourself in some ways here. But um, I, I approach it with this, with probably the, a different lens from Councilmember Patterson. I, I I do believe that tightening up the roads and um, adding additional infrastructure and following complete streets um, is probably a, a very good approach to try to make our streets safer. Yet we don't oftentimes see the two-way cycle tracks or, or lanes. I'm wondering why this project in particular. Is that what's being moved? I'm, I'm excited about it, ha eager to support it, but what rose to the level in, on this project to make the two-way cycle track? Yeah, that's a function of how much physical space we have. Anytime we can separate slower moving vulnerable users from automobiles and vehicles, we will do it. But in a lot of cases, again, it, it looks like we have a lot of right of way, but when you start laying out a cross section of a road, it gets filled up very fast. So ideally, anytime we can, we'll have the two-way cycle track going. Um, if we can, we can have one on each side of the road, and a lot of that is just dependent on the directional volumes that we expect to see based on the trip generators and the destinations. So when we have space, we wanna do it, but a lot of it is just a matter of how much we can fit within what we own, and if we have to do a strip taking, what could be the potential effects of that to a property owner? Um, and as you get on corridors like this, a lot of it just goes into the sidewalk and other areas where we have various public space, whether it be for street furniture, for walking, or other ones. So it's always sort of the art of mixing what we can. Uh, but a lot of it is just a function of physical constraints, not necessarily operational or environmental. Got it. And so for, on Genesee Street in particular, is this going to be on each side of the road? The I, I, I guess I can't picture now if it's northbound and southbound or eastbound and westbound, but on both sides of the road there will be there its own small uh, or, or one lane cycle track going in each. In no, Dominic, can you confirm it's, it's the east side, two way cycle track on the east side? Yeah, so it'll be on the east side. On the east side, there yeah. will be one, two -way one cycle. section with an arrow going this way and an arrow coming this way. Correct. Great. And where does it connect to at either end? Does, it, does this connect all the way out to uh, does that version of the cycle track, I know that you give us maps, but it doesn't nope. always tell us where one part of a cycle track stops and ends? Right, so what it will do is it will transition into a shared use path and then going, uh, going north, 
there are sharrows at that point. Got it. So, and again, part of the design is also looking at how you transition from those various facilities, right? I mean, when it comes to cars, it's pretty simple. We have a lane. We might vary the width. We might vary the striping to say what you can do either can or can't do across that lane. But when it comes to these, we have, we have multiple facilities, and we've got to try and blend them with what makes sense relative to the space we have and what's already been there. So as you look at this, if we do a reconstruction, we want to get that cycle track in whenever there's space. Thank you. That's the connection, the, inter, the interconnect. Thanks. Is, is um, Commissioner, is this, would this be similar to what's been done on Jefferson Avenue with the traffic flow? Because that, being honest with you, um, I don't know if anyone's traveled down Jefferson Avenue from Katy Street or Samuel McCree to Maine, but it is weird. It is weird. Um, and I'm just wondering, are we, are we talking about the same type of traffic flow there because I'm, I'm really not getting this on Jefferson. Yeah, so no, on Genesee Street, it's going to be a, a cycle track that's going to be located behind the curb line mm -hmm. uh, adjacent to the sidewalk, mm -hmm. uh, similar to Elmwood Avenue mm -hmm. cycle track. Um, Jefferson Avenue, that's a, a million resurfacing project. They haven't completed the final pavement markings yet. Um, so probably what you're seeing out there is just a center stripe line that's kind of zigzagging a little bit. Um, we are. Yeah, it looks them. like the guy was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> had a long night. That's all going to make sense. Um, <laughs> uh, honestly, it's, it, we're having some problems getting striping contractors out there in a timely manner. There's only one, one outfit in town that does it. So um, mm -hmm. we are going to put some temporary markings down mm -hmm. in the interim um, to fix that. Right, thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? If not, I entertain a motion. Move it. Second. Move the second. Now we vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion passes. Introduction number 348, authorizing an agreement of the 2025 Millinery Resurfacing Project, North Clinton Avenue, Cumberland Street, to East Ridge Road. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Council President Miguel. Yes, um, thank you, Chair Lightfoot. So looking at the, um, the map, you know, it's ex extensive. I mean, it's the full length of North Clinton pretty much in the city. Um, so my, almost the full length. So my question is related to additional potential infrastructure projects. I know that there's been talk about um, looking at some of the, again, this is a milling and resurfacing project, but also there's, there's other issues on the corridor. And I don't know if this is the time to address it or if that's something that's in the pipeline, but some of the crossings, some of the crosswalks, there's a desire for bump outs, things like that. So is there anything that can be shared in that regard? Yeah, everything you just mentioned will be considered. I mean, when we start doing this, as you noted, it's a milling and resurfacing, which means the curbs are staying put. Um, but everything you mentioned will be looked at if we need to redo crosswalks to update those with respect to the markings, putting down either a different type of material or we can look at different types of crosswalks in terms of the actual design of those. That will be considered as part of the project. So in that vein, um, the, the area between Clifford and Upper Falls, um, we had well, thank you, first of all, for DES placing the temporary uh, crossings there. Is, is that potential to, to get uh, some bump outs in that area? Because that's something that the community has desired. Yeah, we will look at that. All right, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Pio. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, concerning the sidewalk replacement, what does the process look like for follow-up to make sure that the job is done to a certain specification? Because it's you know, thank you very much for the curb, yeah, I'm sorry, for the sidewalks that are being replaced in the great Northwest District. Uh, but some of the work seems to be, I, I get calls every week for where they are for kind of the shoddy work. So what, what does the follow-up look like? Do we have any follow-up to say, you know, as long as concrete's down, we're cool with it? Or is there a, a, a level where we say, you know, we may or may not work with this company again because of the work that was done? What does that look like for follow -up? hazardous sidewalk is a little bit different um in this case we will have resident project representation rpr and that inspector as well as our construction team out of architecture and engineering will be reviewing those um i would take a bit of exception with shoddy work some of the things that you brought up are just unfinished other ones are things that we go through a punch list and check on so um, when we do the rpr in this one you're doing it in a single location not necessarily throughout so it makes it a little easier as they move from phase to phase within that project you have somebody who's 
got that continuity as opposed to going out and checking each one of them. So, um, no, we'll make sure. And, and then with the hazardous sidewalk replacement, absolutely something we've already said is, okay, let's make sure we do a better job of checking these things and making sure they don't get missed. When you look at the volume we're doing, I think we're doing a very good job of making sure that those types of things that I would consider either temporary, um, unfinished, incomplete, incomplete work that we might have to go back out is pretty limited. But on a project like this with a single location, um, that RPR will be, you know, on this project with a plan set, and that's all they're looking at. Okay. Yeah, but one of the issues I've had is rounded, nice curves on a sidewalk are now jagged edges, which I would think that's more of a JV move versus a varsity move. So that's why I say shoddy work. But okay. I just want to see what the follow up. Thank you. No, that's okay. And if you have specific locations, you know, please let us know. We can take a look. There may be a very good reason for why we're doing that. There may be something that's not visible because it's under the ground. And it could be everything from a, a, an actual physical piece of man-made infrastructure to a tree root that we just want to make sure that we're, we're ad properly addressing so we don't have to take out a very mature, you know, tree that provides shade and other elements there on the street. I understand. And I don't mean to disparage. I know no. guys are out there doing hard work. And it's hot out there, too. I can't <laughs> imagine doing that right now. But thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? No, no, I'll entertain a motion. Move it. Second. It's been moved and second. Now we vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Motion carries. Introductory number 349, appropriating funds for the State Street Reconstruction Project. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Councilman McGruber. Thanks. Actually, I just want to piggyback on uh, Chairman Lightfoot's question about any potential delays. The answer we got back was that there won't be any substantial delays, but we do anticipate doing final touches on the project the following spring. Can you just give a sense of like what are what are final touches? Yeah, so a lot of it is is what we call substantial completion, which means you know it's almost detailing, as um, as Karen St. Albany might refer to it with like you know when we get out in snowplow, we get out all the big stuff, and then there's little things. It's uh, uh, similar to what Council Member Peel mentioned. You might get out there and go, oh, that didn't last as long as we expected it to hey, maybe we need to go back and look at resodding something. Maybe there was a saw cut that wasn't done appropriately on a particular sidewalk flag. So no, we're going to have to go out and redo that. But no, um, when, this pro when the contract was signed for the reconstruction of State Street, the first reconstruction since it was originally installed in 1894, um, we were very clear that that was going to be a two-year construction job and that it was going to be completed sometime in late November around Thanksgiving of 2023. So we're still very much on, but no, this is pretty typical for projects where we, like I, I, would, I would use Karen's word, detailing. So just, uh, just for full, full clarity, so, prop, so by the time, hopefully by the time snow hits this winter, everything will be, the roads will be clear for people to drive on both sides, it'll be open. And then maybe when spring hits, there'll be a little bit of touch up here and there, but no substantial closing of traffic on State Street. Correct, that, that, that will be, and part of this is also getting a better handle on what's happening with those, with basically the private property that's within our right of way with the area ways. Um, those are the responsibility of the property owner. Um, it's an ordinance that was passed in 1981. Unfortunately, what we find is um, now that we're putting an emphasis on these, and for those who aren't aware, an area way is effectively your basement that goes out underneath the roadway. Um, so if you picture, here's the, here's the building front, and normally the basement would stop here, it doesn't, it goes into our infrastructure. We have to ensure that we maintain that integrity um, or that they, in they maintain that integrity on their property. Um, but no, we're not seeing anything that would require us to do anything other than maybe some temporary short-term lane closures if we had to do that. Um, not necessarily related to area ways, but that could be, that would be my guess if it happens. Okay, um, but no, we'll have it up and running and, and ideally, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we'll go until late November without snow, um, but no, we'll be ready to go. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Peel. Thank you. This area is pretty tough for me for small businesses over there that, you know, we've had, I believe, two of them close permanently. Um, I know it's not your department for, I believe it's NBD, but is there any talk of when the work extends further than what we had expected, that we have some form of compensation to the businesses to make sure that they are not closing for good, or that they are able to stay open? Um, I, I would defer to Commissioner Miller on that. What I will say is this, though. Um, for every business that has requested any form of assistance or anything like that, Commissioner Miller and his team have, have been great with working with them and trying to do what they can do. I would point out, though, that on that stretch of State Street, there are a number of businesses that have turned over 
Um, this was even pre-pandemic, there was a lot of turnover um, along that stretch. Um, equating the, the reconstruction of that roadway with a success or failure of any particular business, um, good luck trying to show a causal relationship there. There are a number of factors that impact those, and there are long established businesses that have been doing fine as part of the construction. So um, we're always cogn cog um, conscious of, cognizant of what we need to do, but I would say the NBD has been exceptional with reaching out, listening to people, but at a certain point, you know, the city is not, this reconstruction is not responsible for all of the ills troubling their private enterprise. Has it gone longer than we expected, a, a year longer, or should it have been nope. done this year? No, no. The okay. original contract was signed with a completion date of late November. I want to say sometime between the 26th and the 28th of this year. So we are still very much on schedule. Okay. And the last time I checked with the budget, we haven't gotten all the pluses and minuses, but we were around two and a half to three percent above what we thought. Which, on a project of this size, relatively 12 million or so, um, that's pretty good. And again, we haven't started accounting for some of the subtractions that could potentially occur. And with inflation, that's still pretty good. Absolutely. I mean, whenever you get within that, I mean, you know, we come up with these, you know, plan specification and estimate and goes, that's what the only number that matters is the bid. And then after the bid, what, what you find when you're out there. And again, as I noted, um, you know, we were 20 feet in the ground, multiple utilities, never had a reconstruction when jeans, everything was just put in where they could fit it. And we, you know, sometimes you have as built the drawings that are what's supposed to be there. We find stuff. 20, we'll it 20 feet into the ground. Yep. Jeez. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's why when you see this paving, I always like to remind people, by the time you see the paving, we're, d we're done with the hard stuff. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? I'll move it. It's been moved and second. Now we vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The motion carries. I believe that is all of the business for the Parks and Public Works this e afternoon. So with no further business, the Parks and Public Works Committee stands adjourned. Thank you. No, I got that number from construction because I did it myself. I'm like, what are we currently at? Believe me, I'll be really good when that one's done. Oh, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.
At this time, I call the Neighborhood and Business Development Committee to order, and I ask the clerk to call the roll. Sure. Council Member Patterson. Here. Council Member Harris. Here. Council Member Smith. Here. Vice President Lupian. Here. President Melendez. Here. Thank you. All right. Introductory number 350, authorizing the sale of real estate. Questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I need a motion in the second. Move it. Second. second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 350, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. Introductory number 351, authorizing the acceptance by donation of a portion of 251 North Union Street. Questions, comments, or concerns? Council Member Gruber. Thanks. And I'm sorry if this is written somewhere specifically and I missed it, but it, what is the number of parking spots that School 58 needs? Do we know the answer to that? Is there a specific number that they're required to have? Okay, I think you're, I think you're on the next item, 352. Yeah, we're at 350. Oh, three, 350. My, my apologies. 351. Yep, sorry, questions, no questions. comments, concerns on 351? Seeing no. Move it. Seeing, we got a motion and a second. We need a, we got a motion, we need a second. Second. We got a motion and a second, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 351, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. Introductory number 352, authorizing the acquisition of real estate for the Rochester City School District's World of Inquiry School number 58, go Griffins, and amending the 2023-24 budget. Questions, comments, and concerns? I believe this is your spot, Council Member Gruber. That's right, just a question of how many uh, parking spots are required. Okay, Dave Strabel is here from the school district and he will be happy to address that. Turn on the turn on the mic there, Dave. There's there's a somebody help him out with the mic. There should be a switch on it. We currently uh, rent a lot for a hundred spaces from the downstairs cabaret. They're slowly going out of business, so we wanted to buy the lot because we need the parking. Um, we have 48 spaces on our property and we need 100 spaces. That's what we've been renting that lot for. Um, you need 100 total spaces? 100 and 48. We need, Got yeah, it. we have that many employees in the building or and that need for that parking for that building. And that's not some, some that's not a regulation. That's just simply how many spots you ha you need in terms of how many right. people drive to work, right. basically. We have um, 120 something staff faculty in the building but we also need a few visitor parking spaces for parents and you know volunteers and stuff like that okay thanks any other questions comments or concerns seeing none i need a motion and a second move it second moved and seconded and now we vote all in favor of introductory number 352 please say aye aye, aye. all opposed please say nay introductory passes Introductory number 353, amending the zoning map by changing the zoning classification of numbers 1040, 1044, 1100 through 1170, 1180, and 1186 through 1194 University Avenue. Public hearing to be held on Thursday, September 14, 2023 at 6 p.m. Questions, comments, or concerns? Council Member Gruber. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate it. Uh, so. This talks about how um, this particular zoning district is from the 1975 zoning code, but was not carried over to the 20, 2003 zoning code. How, how does how does that happen? So this has just essentially been unzoned for 20 years. Uh, no, it has been uh, the manufacturing industrial plan development district uh, for all that time. So any uses that occurred during that time would have had to match that. Um, but realistically, at some point after the 2003 code was enacted, um, we should have taken a look at this. And what we are doing now is actually building a list of any of those remaining IPDs or MIPDs that did not get rezoned so that we can take a look at those prior to um, the new zoning alignment project. Got it. So, that, I mean, that was the second part of my question. It's not really relevant to, I'm happy to support this amendment, but in terms of the upcoming zoning code rewrite, there will be no more kind of Right. No, we'll, limbo. Catch, we'll catch all those leftover, if there are any more leftover IPDs or MIPDs or PDDs or anything, Okay. we will make sure those all get updated. Great, thank you. All right, any other questions, comments, or concerns? 
Seeing none, need a motion. Oh, Council Vice President. Yeah, I'm just looking through. Have there been any um, public meetings regarding this change? Um, the uh, the Planning Commission held a hearing, so that would be the one public meeting. Um, I'm not aware of any other. But like sometimes meeting. for for um, projects that are going on or um, street changes, there's meetings in the in the neighborhood. But it's just been the planning board meeting. The planning the commission yeah. okay. had a public hearing, right? Okay. And were there any speakers? Um, I'm not. Uh, it says one person spoke, and that one person spoke in support of the rezoning. There was no one who spoke in opposition. So okay. that's what happened at the hearing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I need a motion and a second. Move Second. second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote on introductory number 353. All in favor of introductory number 353, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. Introductory number 354 authorizes a loan agreement and payment in lieu of taxes for the Center City Courtyard Affordable Housing Project. Questions, comments, or concerns? Council Member Harris. Thank you. Um, Chairperson Patterson, I just got a question. Um, I noticed in section three um, where it says the mayor, um, the legislation will authorize the mayor to execute other agreements and documents as necessary to complete these agreements. So can you kind of explain to that? Is this, this is an anticipated additional agreements for this that's coming or could you explain that part? Okay, uh, thank you, Council Member. It really is just something to cover anything that might get missed in this. We have identified everything that we believe is required, the loan agreement, the property tax exemption, the pilot agreement, um, and the opportunity in number four to adjust the interest rate. But if there's anything else that comes up, um, this would authorize the mayor to execute that agreement. So we don't have to come back or delay the project. So that would that would mean just to clarify, the mayor would not have to come back to council for. We're, we're not anticipating okay. anything else, but the mayor would not have to come back. That's correct. All right. Thank you for clarity. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Yes. Yes. So I, I have a few questions. So it's nice to see some new housing development. Hi, Commissioner Miller. Um, so I wanted to know. You forgot, know Commissioner Councilman. But okay. <laughs> No, I didn't. I figured I'd switch it up. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. But thank you, Commissioner Counselor. So um, how were the three supportive services agencies chosen? Is it just based on the three organizations who received the grant funding, or was there some type of special process? The, um, the project developers are the ones who chose that. I believe we have a representative here. We have, we have multiple representatives. Great. So Would love to hear from. Come on forward. Yeah. Would love to hear from someone from uh, Eagle Star and Helio Health. Okay. Well, this is Whitney McClary. Whitney is part of the development team that is, uh, has been leading this project. Thank you, uh, Whitney McClary, uh, Deve Development Director for CSD Housing, who's the co-developer for this project. Uh, to answer your first question of how these groups were chosen, um, initially once we found the site, we were excited to provide affordable and supportive housing in downtown Rochester. And the first thing we did was we went to the CLC, which keeps all the data on individuals experiencing homelessness. And we sat down with them and we had a discussion and we really want to understand what the demand was, you know, what groups were in the most need of housing. And that's initially how we chose the population. So veterans, um, people experiencing uh, substance use disorder, people experiencing severe mental illness, and also homeless veterans. Um, I think I said that, substance use disorder, homeless veterans, and um, those are the four populations. So uh, once we have those populations identified, we started to reach out to not-for-profits who had experience in Eshi. Eshi is Empire State Supportive Housing Initiative. Um, this is a funding service to allocate operational dollars to the building. And so um, not only they give you capital dollars to build the building, but once the building is built, to have additional money to operate the building. So each of these service providers will have staff in the building. Um, this dollar, the funding also goes towards security uh, for the building and services for those individuals. And so 
Uh, we wanted to find groups who are in the community uh, currently and we're working with these populations. And so that's how the three groups were identified. Yeah, to, um, a question to your last statement about groups working in the community. What about Helio Health? Because I think they're originally out of Syracuse. They're originally out of Syracuse, but they do have a presence here. And we do have a representative if you have um, more detailed questions. But um, we've done many projects with them. They actually just invested and opened up a new facility. Um, they're also participating in the same type of uh, service at Edna Craven, which is just opening up. They have some units there. Um, so they do have a presence here in Rochester, although they're headquartered in Syracuse. Okay. And then my last question is, how will they, these organizations, how will they prioritize and determine housing eligibility? Is it going to be based on the individual agency's need or the coordinated entry criteria? Coordinated entry. So they'll be in partnership with uh, the CLC That'll be their main source of finding uh, potential residents. Um, they'll also, because they're in their neighborhoods, for example, the Urban League is already working with people that have been in the justice system. And so they already have people in mind uh, for this project, but it will be a lottery system. So it'll be fair, everyone who meets the criteria mm. as far as the income level and you know, a veteran, make sure they're a veteran, make sure they have experience homeless. Once they meet that criteria, they'll apply and they'll be in that lottery system and we'll continue to work through the, that lottery for each of those units until they're built. In terms of the coordinated entry, do you know offhand how long the time frame is from the time someone is introduced into the system to the time that they receive housing? So it really varies. A lot of it's driven by the applicant's ability to provide the right documentation showing their income. A lot of times that's really the hold up that they have to the leasing agents have to really work hard to provide to reach out to their employers, um, you know, some of their veterans if they're getting um, different subsidies to, to really sure that when we say this person makes this certain amount of income that we're accurate um, for compliance reasons. And so that's really the hold up. Um, you know, we, we see it could be anywhere from, you know, three weeks to six weeks, but it's really driven by the applicant's ability to provide all the documentation needed. But of course, we want to fill the units as soon as possible. So we try to do everything on our end to, to meet that goal. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Council Member Gruber. Yeah, um, I, I've heard that uh, the eShy environment right now is very challenging from a number of different housing providers, and I think it's mostly related to how the state program works. I'm not an expert in it, <clears throat> but I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I presume that um, the developers and the, and the nonprofit partners have all kind of thought about this in, in making this proposal, but is there anything you want to just comment on about what the challenges with Eshi are and why this project is poised to not have any such issues? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think Rochester itself, the city has been pretty fortunate in providing supportive housing without as many challenges as we've seen in some of the other parts of the state. Um, but to answer your question, we really, again, we try to get top-notch not-for-profits to uh, make sure that you know they know their populations well. Um, each each unit comes with $25,000 per year in operational funding, and so that will allow us to hire additional staff to have security, nightly security. Um, but it's it's a, it's definitely a challenge. Any you can go to any multifamily housing unit that has lower incomes or you know mixed populations that there, there's gonna there's always gonna be challenges. You can't predict human behavior, but we try to do things like limit the access. So for this building, we'll only have one point of entry so that we have eyes on everyone coming into the building. We've experienced that in some of our other projects that if you have a, a side building where someone can prop open the door and let their friends in, you're not aware of everyone in the building. So that, that's one thing, uh, making sure security, that we know exactly everyone coming in, um, that they have to go by the security guard, they have to check in. Um, and then it's really up to our property managers and our three not-for-profit providers. Um, most housing projects, they only really have one not-for-profit. By combining you know, all three, um, plus the property manager will have anywhere from 15 to 20 people in the building at one time. We think that will help. Um, but we currently own a 270 East Ave uh, in Rochester and it's an Eastside population. Uh, we have veterans there, we have uh, seniors there as well. Um, and we've seen some challenges. Some of the challenges have been from just the AMI. You know, they're, they're not even Eastside units, they're just, you know, individuals who live there. Um, but you know, there's we can't. I can't sit up here and say that there won't be any challenges going forward. But we try to mitigate that with security, with staff, 
and really making sure that um, all these not-for-profits do their best ability to get to know their residents and have a personal relationship with them because that that's really goes far creating relationships with people to make sure that you know if they are having challenges they're experiencing difficulties in their life that they have someone to talk to and we try to nip it in the bud before it becomes a problem for the larger community I, I appreciate that what, the cha I think the challenges I was referring to more is I've heard of I, I won't name any uh, particular buildings or property managers, but I've heard about some Ishai units that actually have, or Ishai buildings that have a lot of open vacant units, despite obviously us knowing that there's a lot of need and a lot of housing instability in Rochester, that some of the requirements of Ishai make it challenging for the property managers to even connect people to be able to utilize the incredible services that you and the many providers here are able to offer. How, how, are you, how is this project going to, I mean, when do you expect to be at full capacity? Yeah, so we, we haven't seen those challenges. Um, to be honest, in our projects, there's a wait list. In every single one of our projects, there's a wait list at Edna Craven, which just opened up for all the population. So we haven't seen that. Again, to, to my previous answer of some of the lag in timing to actually get those people in the door. Um, you know, someone can get all the way through the compliance period and they're ready to move in and change their mind, and then you got to start over with sure. a new individual. But as far as demand and getting people in the door, I personally haven't seen that okay. in any of our projects. Thank you. Council Vice President. Um, the question um, Council Member Gruber had, how long do you expect to be to take to be fully staffed? Do you know? So this building will take about two years to build. We're hoping to break ground October 11th. Um, and I would say, you know, once fully we rented, not fully staffed. I'm sorry. I said I, I said fully staffed, but oh. not fully rented. <laughs> yeah. So from once we get our CFO, mm -hmm. um, we anticipate, you know, three months. That's that's probably what took us to, to lease up 270. Um, but again, some of that's is not in our control. We have to follow the lottery, so it's really up to individuals. But there's going to be a waiting list for this building. It's going to be a beautiful building. There's there's so much demand for this housing. So thank um, you. There's a lot of things I, I think about and worry about, but getting people in the door is, is honestly not one of them for this project. Um, I appreciate the breakdown that was provided, um, the number of you know, bedrooms and the different um, populations and the numbers, but I would like to see kind of like a side-by-side -side um, breakdown of, bed, and I can send this to you as well, but bedrooms, population served, uh, what the rents will be and what percentage of income um, the units will be targeted at kind of all in a row, but also um, for the units where it's, uh, you know, percent of income that the, the rents will be instead of maybe a number. Uh, does that make sense to have it kind of all lined up? Okay. And I can provide that in writing um, just so we're clear <laughs> what I'm asking for. And then the last question. Um, when we talk AMI, just for my memory, are we talking Monroe County or the five county area? Monroe County. Monroe County. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other council president? Yeah, j just one comment. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's involved in, in this project for pulling together a $70 million investment in our community. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Councilmember Harris. I'd like to, um, if you could please just add to um, Vice President Luthien's um, request. I'm really interested to know what kind of amenities you have for the audiovisual impaired accessible units. Um, I, we don't get a lot of that in our in our area, so I'd just like to know what you have. Could you add that in there too? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure the number of units. Um, I believe we have to do, I believe it's five to eight percent, but don't quote me on that, that we have to have that a certain amount of those units be uh, AV accessible. Are you asking what specifically the, the, the would be? The amenities, like, you know, what would, what would make it um, accessible, you know? So, so you're, you're asking about what kinds of things, a uh, visual yeah. doorbell or, or other kinds of things that would be for audio visual impairment? Yes, okay. thank you. We can, we can sort that out, thank you. Yeah, so I, I think there's compliancy um, issues where the state tells us exactly for those AV units exactly what will need to be done. So, like you said, audio, visual, doorbells um, within the bathrooms, there'll be you know additional protections. Um, you know, there won't be tubs; there'll be walk-in showers and, and things like that. But 
So you're just following the state guidelines. I didn't know if you were going above or below the state guidelines. So that. Following the state guidelines, but I think that's a good point. And uh, we are a number, probably a year off before we're actually designing or going and starting to build the unit. So that's something we can take in mind and maybe reach out to some of the AV community and make sure we are thinking of things that we could do in addition besides just the uh, state required guidelines. Absolutely. Thank you. Council Member Smith. Yeah, I mean, as I stated earlier, I think it's, it's good that it, th these housing developments are wonderful. My concern is just continuing to be the number of units that are two bedroom or more. The majority are single bedroom. And we have a lot of single mothers in the community in need of housing. And so only 10 of these units, if I'm looking at this correctly, are two bedrooms. And so I don't know if that's a, a question that you can answer or just a food for thought or a challenge for the future as we are doing these housing developments. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I believe we have 17 uh, two bedrooms for this project, but that's definitely yeah, a low 17. percentage um, of the number of 164 units. Um, because we're so heavy on the support of housing, we have 95 units of support of housing. Uh, most of those individuals are demand studios and, and one bedrooms. And so that, that's really the bulk of it. All of our ESHI units are studios and one bedrooms. And so that kind of creates, you know, 95 of the 164. But it's something to definitely keep in mind. You know, every project or one project can't meet all the needs of the community. And uh, maybe in our next project, we can uh, have a little bit more two bedrooms. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 354, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. Introductory passes. Okay, introductory number 355. Before I, re before I get into it, I'm going to read the disclosure of interest. Um, disclosure of interest is regarding President Melendez. He is required to recuse from deliberations and the vote. And introductory number 355 is authorizing the sale of real estate, a loan agreement, and payment in lieu of taxes agreement for the Alta Vista 8 at St. Joseph's Park Affordable Housing Project. Do we have any questions, comments, or concerns? I have just one. Council member. And I'm wondering if the YWCA will be providing services to everyone in each of the 76 units, or is there a chosen few? We have someone here from, from the development team come forward. Good evening. I'm, I'm Chris Rowland from Edgemere Development. Uh, Hi, how are development you? Development consultant with Eugenio uh, from IADC. And uh, we have a representative from the YW as well. Uh, it'll be for 14 of the 76 units. 14. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any council member, council vice president? Um, I have the, I'll have the same question for this as well as I did for the last one. You have the same question or you have a different question? The same question. The same question about the <laughs> breakdown of the units okay. and the rents. Same and question. Yeah. All right, we got you. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, I need a motion and a second. So moved. We, we got a, we've got a motion and a second, and now we vote. All in favor of introductory number 355, please say aye. 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 All opposed, please say nay. We abstain. have one abstention, and we have one abstention. All right. Um, introductory passes. At this time, there is no other business before this committee, and we stand adjourned. Thank you.